My friends, my friends, welcome to The Bike Lane. I am your host, Tom Ziska. We are glad to have you with us as we talk about all things bicycles. Glad to have you. How are you? Welcome to uh, wherever you are. And as uh, as I see people um, kind of catching on here, um, I thought we were recording this. I have high hopes that we're recording. Um, and we can show this at a later time, but uh, feel free to, to comment as we go on. Um, the bike lane, if you're new to this, we talk about all things bicycles, uh, whether you're an experienced rider, whether you're a beginning rider, rider, recreational, riding around your neighborhood or uh, going miles and miles and miles, uh, we'll have something here for you. Um, and uh, we'll talk about um, doing it safely as well, which brings us here today. Uh, the fine friends at LendingTree.com, you've probably seen them uh, on various and sundry uh, stories or internet references. They did a study on the safety of uh, particularly Texas highways and roads, and uh, they wanted to identify where the most dangerous, the most deadly ones were in Texas. I know you'll be shocked, uh, shocked, I understand, a um, little bit of sarcasm there many many of the most dangerous and deadly roads in texas are in houston sadly enough um and uh, our friends at uh, bikehouston.org the bike advocacy group here as well has documented over the years hundreds of uh, of accidents and deaths on houston roads for cyclists over the last uh, several years it is it can't be it doesn't have to be but it can be very dangerous out there. And with that in mind, I want to bring in our guest here. Uh, Jennifer Boyd is the uh, is the director and producer of a new documentary called the um, Oh, help me out, Jennifer. The Street Project. The Street Project. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to. It's uh, okay. Uh, you know, I got screens here. Um, Jennifer is in Connecticut and we appreciate your time, Jennifer. Um, because uh, you have uh, you have produced with your team this documentary because these dynamics of safety and 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 uh, deadliness, if you can, are not unique to Houston uh, for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, what did you find, and 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 um, what what prompted this uh, this documentary? Um, so thank you so much for having me on, yeah. on the show, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, so what happened was I found a number of transportation related documentaries. And my last one, uh, I was called three seconds behind the wheel. And I put cameras into cars and monitored driving behavior. And um, it was all about distraction. And then what I, I Oh, it did well. There's, you know, it's in streaming and driving schools use it and all sorts of things like that. And I thought that I was going to do a second documentary on how distraction impacts pedestrians and cyclists because half of all fatalities worldwide happen outside of the car. So it seemed like a natural part two. So I pitch it, I get some funding for it. It's going to be a documentary about distraction outside of the car. And then within a few seconds of doing real research, I realized that distraction had nothing to do with the fatalities outside of the car, the human behavior, I should say, outside mm -hmm. of the car, which was something I was going to study. And it had everything to do with things like road design, size of cars, new speeds of cars, speeds on roads, and a lot of the other things that we talk about in the doc. Mm -hmm. And thus began this journey to create this project and film um, that continues to have a life of its own. Well, let's give folks a taste of what uh, what you're talking about. We have the trailer for the street project here. It's about three minutes and um, it's a uh, it's a good taste of, uh, of, of the journey for, for this project. So uh, we'll be right back after you take a look at this. When we're thinking about pedestrian and cycling issues, what is the issue today? Survival. It's been a bloody 24 hours. More than a million people die in traffic-related crashes worldwide each year. It's really a big problem. Half of those deaths involve pedestrians and cyclists. Killed after being hit by a council bus. So why is this happening, and what can we do about it? Welcome to The Street Project. 
in our neighborhoods, the streets get wider, which encourage speeding. And as far as protected bike lanes, there are hardly any or none. Hey, crosswalk, crosswalk. That crosswalk over there turning is suicide by crosswalk 24-7. Really, really bizarrely, no one thought there was anything odd about having a road that was just the boulevard of death. My mother was walking when she was hit. I was biking when I was hit. That's just crazy. Yeah. That's no coincidence. Low-income communities are more susceptible to traffic violence. A forward-looking city is conscious of the automobile and automobile traffic as key factors. Like so many people these days, we live in the suburbs, and Dave needs the car every day for business. When he was gone, I was practically a prisoner in my own home. But that's all changed now. Well, the 1950s, when there was a massive urban transformation, we all believed in the car as the only vehicle that we'll ever need in the future. This transformed cities all over the world, and not least Copenhagen. And a lot of people look to the Nordics and say, oh, yeah, they just ride bikes because they're all so environmentally conscious, you know? The bicycle is a little pink unicorn for a better future. No. Whatever we grow up with seems normal. And this can make it really hard to recognize better possibilities. We're going to turn right, look left, and for that good reason, so we don't bump into all the cyclists here. On a bike lane like this, we can move 6,000 people per hour. We just did a little experiment, and we closed one street with the sandwich board and it said for emergency vehicles only. When we had COVID devastating this neighborhood and all these people are dying. People living in parts of Queens and the Bronx have found themselves in the epicenter of the virus. You would come out here and the kids were having the best summer of their life. <laughs> <coughs> And they're asking how we can have less pedestrian fatalities. Right. Well, come out and look. Thank you and God bless you for- This is a story about the global citizen-led fight to make our streets safer. That was good. Stop reckless driving. Safe streets now. Our streets. Our streets. Our streets. The Street Project uh, being uh, debuted in Houston um, tonight, Monday night, uh, as part of the uh, um, the Bike Summit in Houston, three days of bicycle-related conversations and topics and that sort of thing. Jennifer Boyd is the... Uh, station alert has arrived. Oh, good. I got a telephone that talks to me as well. Uh, Jennifer Boyd is the director and producer of The Street Project. D Jennifer, there's a lot of, uh, just looking at the, um, at, at the trailer, a lot of passion on the parts of the people who are uh, who are uh, activists for these topics. And it's not just cyclists, but pedestrians as well. Yes. Um, so when I started this project, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't creating another piece of media content that sensationalizes or gives people a reason to bury their head in the sand and say, no, enough bad news. I don't want to hear anymore. And so what I tried to do is create something that is really inspiring. It, I, hopefully it doesn't feel like a giant lecture. Hopefully it's not painful to watch. Hopefully it's just, it's inspiring. It's storytelling. It's interesting and entertaining. I hope people feel that way. And um, so it was important to find people that were passionate and had good stories to tell and were really comfortable on camera. Mm -hmm. So, uh... You have traveled to um, uh, to uh, New York. You traveled to Phoenix. It looks like you traveled abroad as well, uh, where certainly um, their infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists is uh, is vastly different for a variety of reasons. Um, is there any place in the United States that's doing this right? That's that's doing a good job minimizing these these interactions between vehicles. And uh, yeah. Well, you know, I have to say that uh, uh, 10 years ago, I never would have biked around Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I would have been terrified. And um, about um, after, after filming the doc, uh, I went back into the city and I got uh, out of Grand Central Station mm -hmm. and I looked on my phone and I was going to a museum and I wanted to see which way would be the fastest way to get there. 
And it turned out that I think the, the you know, the subway was going to be like 40 minutes and walking would, would take a pretty long time. Uber and the taxis were going to be 40 and getting a bike from a city bike was going to be 20 minutes. And I thought, wow, that's perfect. That's exactly what they were talking about in Copenhagen. We don't want bike lanes that just go these circuitous routes through beautiful parks. We need bike lanes that go from point A to point B really quickly so it's an efficient way to safely um, safely get from one point to another, a, a transportation option that's realistic. Well, anyway, so I'm still, a, I'm very timid about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, cars, etc. So <laughs> I looked at where the city bike was located. I looked around the corner to make sure to see if there was protected bike lanes. And in fact, there were, and I looked on the Google maps and it looked like the protected bike lane was going to extend all the way. I hop on the bike for the first time in my life in Manhattan, in any city aside from Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And I, we ended up biking all day long from the, like 90 blocks or more all day long. And I felt completely safe because of the protected bike lanes that didn't exist 10 years ago mm -hmm. and continue to be expanding. So from a real life personal experience, I would say that really New York has done a tremendous job. Mm -hmm. I do see it in Boston. I know there are other communities um, in Indiana, for example, um, in parts of California that are really doing a great job. Um, but the key is that protection from those, you know, much bigger vehicles. It's not like we have to choose between one or the other. We need a variety of forms of transportation. We just all need to be able to do it safely. Let's talk a little bit about that, because here in Houston, and you may have seen a little bit about it there. Um, I mean, we've kind of had some spots where there are uh, where are there high comfort protected uh, bike lanes available for cyclists. Uh, but Houston, like so many um, large cities in this country, are is is very spread out. It's it's designed for commuters, um, and the vast majority of users are are drivers. Sure. And and there the reason for this this documentary because there's because there are these activists is because there is pushback and some of it understandable in some ways um, between this this volume of traffic that gets, needs to get someplace and this other group of people um, walkers pedestrians and cyclists who also want to get there safely as well. Um, did you find? Is there any winning argument, really, uh, for those two sides to, uh, to, to to find common ground? Yeah, you know, there was an activist that I was talking to a few weeks ago who was very thoughtful about that question in particular. Um, we never, it can't be an either or, can it? Um, we can never really, any of us, win if it's just an either or. And a lot of the work that um, we talk about with Vision Zero of, of narrowing streets and calming streets stuff um, are all about um, making streets safe for everybody, making streets safe for the driver, the pedestrian, the cyclist, the maybe the e-bike person. Um, and so we have to remember that if we create safer streets, where the speeds are actually a little slower, where, you know, you have a fighting chance to see people that are coming from other directions and other forms of transportation. We're making it safer for the pedestrian, but also the person in the automobile. This is, this is for everybody. It isn't just the cycle of saying we demand everything. It really is, is about all of us coming together to create a transportation network that works for the driver mm -hmm. and the pedestrian and the cyclist and others who are out there and senior citizens and, and people who are handicapped because our, our, our streets are our largest public spaces. They're public spaces. They aren't automobile spaces, they're public spaces. Mm -hmm. And so we need them to just work for everybody, including the driver. I've had this conversation with some others, and I think it's an important place to note here as well that when we talk about cyclists in particular, um, not 
not universally certainly, but but to a large degree, we're not talking about the recreational um, recreational weekend warrior type person who wants to go out and you know do dozens and dozens of miles. I'll raise my hand. I'm that guy. But there are so many people for whom the bicycle is their only means of transportation to the store, to the doctor, to work. And and they are often not in places. And I, and I believe there was a reference in, in the uh, in the trailer um, for underserved communities uh, to have these safe places. Um, yes, it is certainly important to think about that, that um, vehicles are expensive. More than one vehicle is expensive. Cars are, are more expensive than they've ever been before. And that bikes are an important form of transportation or scooters or e-bikes or whatever they may be for so many workers out there. Um, and in addition, you know, do we all have to have two or three cars? I mean, whether we can afford to or not if we have a, a safe infrastructure that might be a little bit more environmentally friendly that might allow you to just make that quick shop, shopping trip on a bike whatever you know why not um but yes of course uh this isn't um just about the the men in lycra the mammals oh that's cool uh, but it's actually it's about all of us and it's about workers who need to get to work um at all sorts of times of, of day Yes, very much so, and we need to think about them. Uh, you referenced the mammals, M-A-M-I-L, middle-aged <laughs> males in life. Thank you for helping me about yeah. <laughs> I, I, I am that guy. Yes. Uh, probably so. Um, so where does this documentary leave us um, in the mind? Um, should we be hopeful? Should we be um, inspired? Should we be angered? Uh, by by what's going on or all of the above? Uh, no, I, you know, I think more hopeful than ever before, really. Um, we're at a turning point for a couple of reasons. One, um, after COVID, people realized that they could use their streets for other means to create um, uh, interesting, safe, connected spaces with their neighbors. And they didn't have to go through planning and zoning and long, um, a very long, arduous process. They were able to do it overnight. And so there is this understanding that more so than ever that streets can be used in different ways. Um, the other uh, thing that's, that is really hopeful is um, now that we have the trans transportation infrastructure law, there is money out there more than there has been in, in many, many, many decades to create new infrastructure. And we know that um, communities are given priority if they invest in bike and pedestrian safe spaces as part mm -hmm. of its overall design, those communities are prioritized for funding. And so we are at a point where we really can create change and make streets more accessible for, for everyone. Um, with the documentary, it is being used as a, a, a way to connect communities now. Um, people from around the country are licensing the film for community showings. Mm -hmm. You can do that at thestreetproject.com. Um, I hope you don't mind the plug. Thestreetproject.com. Nope, nope, and um, you can license the film. Uh, Nonprofit organizations can use it as a fundraiser for their own organizations have a movie night. It's a safe way to bring new people into your organization without them having to feel like they have a, need a lot of knowledge to come to a meeting. They don't need to say anything. They can just come and watch the film and maybe gradually be introduced to the movement in your community. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where we are now with it. Um, so before I let you go and you kind of touch on it, um, how do people see this? If, uh, if they if they miss the opportunity to uh, to, to see it in Houston um, and maybe they don't belong to a group that can they can sponsor a showing um, right. how, how do I see it so it's be it's streaming through P, uh, PBS on mm -hmm. YouTube their their YouTube channel it's being distributed through PBS International and um, it's available on Amazon as well 
Um, so you can always go to the streetproject.com and click on the various links and you'll find ways to um, watch it. It, has, it will have commercials in it, but um, you know, it's, uh, there are options. Fair enough. Uh, Jennifer Boyd, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, um, taking a few moments to tee up the entire uh, documentary as well um, and, uh, and see what, uh, what the conversation is uh, in these communities that, uh, that you touched on. But we appreciate you uh, stopping here in Houston to talk about it as well. And uh, maybe we inspire some folks to take a look. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. Excellent. Jennifer, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well my friends, thank you as well. Um, again, I'm going to figure out, I, I, I was certain I was recording this, but it looks like it's live. So we'll make sure it runs Monday night um, at 6.30 p.m. as well. Meantime, thrilled to have uh, all of you. There's a dozen of you who uh, kind of watched the whole thing. Appreciate you as well. If you've got an idea about something bike related, whether it's, uh, whether it's you know, high end, how do I do this to, to low end, you know, what's the right helmet or anything in between, send me a question. You see there in the bottom of the screen, all the ways to get a hold of me. Um, I want to hear from you. And if there's a if there's a way I can make it a story and I'm pretty good at that, uh, I will I will do just that. But uh, until next time, my friends, thanks for traveling on the bike lane with me. I'm Tom Ziska. We'll see you next time.